Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming to our session. I know it's the last session of the day, and you must be quite excited about after having spent the whole day here. <laughs> um, let me start with what we, where I come from and what this Everything CQC is. Obviously, my chair hasn't heard of it either. It's an absolutely free website that we had actually originally created for our clients, and what it ha tries to do is demystify CQC. All the outcomes that you spend hours reading, we've actually converted it into plain English, gives you tips and tricks of how to actually comply and get there with the least possible effort and the least amount of pain. Um, my background in compliance is that I've been working with the, in the industry and in the healthcare market for the five, last five years and actually do compliance audits for commercial companies in the healthcare market. So today, I'm just going to, as you will appreciate, this is quite a large subject, preparing for an inspection. So what I'm going to try and do is compress everything and give you a flavor of what our seminars are about. And our usual seminars about last about a couple of hours. So let's try fitting that into half an hour and walk away with some positive things today. Um, our mantra is CQC changes nothing, but changes everything. Now that all of us have gone through registration, we'll come to realize that there's nothing new in CQC. There was nothing new in those 28 outcomes that we were so fearful about. We were all already doing quite a fair few of them in one form or another, whether it was for GMS contracts, PMS, QOF, etc., health and safety. So there's nothing really new in CQC. So why has this become such a bane of our lives and why are we spending so much time trying to comply with it? Well, the biggest change and the reason it changes everything is this. Whereas before, our compliance was almost compressed into between January and March, where we were running around trying to get our quaff figures right, get our appraisals done, get our IG toolkit done, and make sure everything was done in a very short space of time. Now we have to comply 24-7, 365 days a year, and we have the added fear of an inspector walking in through the door, giving us 48 hours notice and saying, I want to see how you're complying on a daily basis, on a monthly basis. And that's what's really changed. Preparing for an inspection. So what's the biggest challenge here? But everybody sees inspection that, oh, I'll be inspected maybe in a month's time, six months' time. And yes, there is this unknown fear I could be inspected any time. But the inspection's not about that particular day. The inspection's actually, what are you doing between today and the day of the inspection? It's actually going to be looking at your historic data. And your preparation for that starts, or should have started, on the 1st of April. Your registration was the easy bit. Now comes the hard work of actually proving that you did what you said you did when you said you did it. That's what the inspector's viewpoint is, and that's what he's looking for. So how about do we manage this inspection that happens? Um, we are always, the practices that I always talk to say, well, yes, the inspector will tell me this, they'll tell me what outcomes they're looking for, and then I'll be able to show them the evidence. I've got my policies manual here and I've got something there. I'm actually, what we prescribe to our clients is saying, take charge of the inspection, manage it yourself. Don't wait for the inspector to come and tell you, I'm looking for such and such. Take charge, tell them how you manage. So when they first arrive, you can actually say to them, this is what my organization structure is. These are the partners, this is how I manage, this is how I delegate. Give them like a, maybe a flow chart of how your organization is. Tell them what you do with your evidence of monitoring. Your evidence of monitoring is, this is a key phrase in CQC. How do you monitor and review your practice? This is about your management structure and how your management, your registered manager, together with the other partners and the practice manager, look at how we are performing. How do we change the outcome? So if, for example, something's not working, how do we as a team decide this is working, let's implement it, or let's change something? One question that oh, I always get asked, what policies do I need for CQC? Are there special policies for CQC? CQC themselves have been going on and on for the last year saying you do not need any special policies for CQC. So don't come, go and hand over your policies manual to the CQC inspector because they're not looking for policies. If you give them the policies, you're handing ammunition because they'll be looking through your policy folder, picking one obscure one out and going to your staff and saying, do you know about this? Wait till the inspector asks you about your policies. Then hand over that particular policies rather than giving the whole manual over and saying, thumb through this and find the one that I don't know about. 
The other thing that you could do to manage it and to control it is tell them how organized are you? How do you do your training? What's your action plan? What have you done so far? What things are missing that you haven't done as yet? And how do you plan to achieve them? It's about showing how you actually manage your business and how, what precautions you've taken to avert all the issues that might arise. On the morning of the inspection, I would actually take the inspector around a quick tour of my building, tell them where the fire escapes are, tell them if there is a fire um, drill planned for that day, if, what happened, where the loos are, etc. Just giving them a feel of your organization and how you're, you treat a visitor has a great impact on how they perceive what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, chaperoning is another one. Don't let them wander around your building. Make sure there's someone allocated to them so that if they are, need to ask questions, they can if they, they just don't accidentally go into a patient's room or where a patient is. And you're controlling what access the inspector has. You're in charge of that day. They've come to visit you. Make sure you give them a room for the privacy where they can make phone calls, etc. If they need any information, if they want to write things down, they can do it without feeling as if they're, they're divulging information. And do remember that you do have a right of reply. At the end of the day, you do have the opportunity of actually discussing, having a debrief with them. You make sure that you can write things down so that if they ever chat, ask you about things or say that you didn't provide them evidence, you can send a follow on after they've actually been on the day. So the inspection doesn't finish on the day of the inspector coming and visiting you. It actually can last for a week or so when you can exchange information with the inspector. And the CQC are very, very open to this, saying the more information you provide, the more accurate your report is going to be. What you're showing them, in essence, is how professionally you treat every visitor to the practice. Treating them with respect is giving them a flavor because the CQC is all about how do we deal with our patients. If we deal with any visitor with such courtesy, we must be treating our patients well as well. We are very, very lucky in the GP industry. We've been given 48 hours notice that they will email us, phone us, send us a letter saying when are the, our visits going to be. What are we going to do with these 48 hours? I've come up with a few ideas and I'm going to summarize some of them. And if you've got any yourselves, please raise your hand and shout out what else you would do. How would I use my 48 hours? First thing I would do I know my cleaner comes in and does a brilliant job. I would make sure that the CQC inspector finds nothing. I would get professionals in. I would have someone on emergency call saying, I want a complete steam clean from top to bottom, shelves, etc., everything, so that let's not give them a chance. They've given us the time. Why not do it? I'll make sure all my notices, the things that they will go around my practice and see are in place. Nothing's out of date. I don't have frayed posters on the walls. These are things we can actually achieve quickly. A lot of practices are saying, oh, no, but I'll go and look at my policy manual. Forget it. You don't have time. You've got 48 hours. You've got seven working hours. Use it efficiently. I would reschedule some appointments. Might be cheeky, but if I have an awkward patient booked for the day of the inspection, I might think, hmm, let's change it. Make them come slightly early, or I'll go see them, call them in the day before. But you don't want that patient sitting in reception when the inspector is there and the inspector goes and talks to them. I would actually even reschedule some to have some time for the inspector as well. I would actually make sure that my staff are briefed. I would not tell all my staff what's going on because you, the last thing you want is someone to take days, a day off because they're frightened, uncomfortable with the inspector being there, etc. So I'd, generally, I would just retrain or, or debrief my staff on certain training issues like tell them about safeguarding, IG, um, cleanliness, etc. So I'll choose the main topics, have a meeting with them, and then with my key staff, tell them that we are going to have an inspection in two days' time so that everyone's prepared, but we're not creating unnecessary anxiety. I would admit, this is my, one of my favorites. 
I would actually make sure that the patients that are in over the next two days, my staff actually give out leaflets, make sure they are trained to be extra nice to my patients. I would generally hope my practice does that anyway, but over the next two days, we'll make sure that whenever there's a complaint or anybody talks to us, we'll give them the correct information, whatever is available. It's basically saying, let's love bomb our patients for the next two days. So on the day, it's second nature to us, we're doing it anyway. Medicine management, make sure all my medicines are in date, make sure temperature logs have been corrected, there are no odd medications lying around in the clinical rooms, everything is up to date so that we don't get picked up on this. Ooh, horrible one. Make sure everyone for the next two days is disinfecting their hands. When the inspector walks in, make them disinfect their hands. We're sending out a message. We take infection control quite seriously. We make sure everybody who comes into our building doesn't have a chance of having dirt on their hands and rubbing it on our chairs and then the next patient comes and sits on it. Last one. Can anyone guess what this is? Yep. It's not the ad from the thing uh, from the television. It's actually, I, we we all have one of these in our offices. An awkward member of staff, the one who will do something silly on the day. Somebody will say, "Well, yeah, I was trained, but I, I wasn't listening." Give them the day off. And if you want to find out more details, because I can see my time is running out and I've got to allow for questions as well, if you want more details about preparing for inspections or any other element or any other tips and tricks, please log on to a site. It's absolutely free. It's called everythingcqc.com. Um, and if you've got any queries, please send them to us. We'll research it and put it on our site if it's not already on there. Any questions? Yeah, Shabana, thank you very much indeed. Let can I just point out to you, with, with all due respect, every single practice represented here in this room is doing everything already that you pointed out. Yep. And the idea, if there are any members of the medical press here, that practices are going to be running around cleaning up in the 48 hours before the CQC inspectors come along is entirely fallacious, wrong, and will not be happening. So that's all <laughs> sorted out. <laughs> Do we, <laughs> do we have any questions, please? We must have questions on this subject. Yes, sir. Gentleman there. Hello, I'm Andrew Sproson from Jones Lang LaSalle. Uh, I deal with property. I'm just interested in the property elements for CQC and hot topics that uh, may be covered off uh, on a visit. Can you help on that one? Sorry, uh, one of the ma major ones that ca keeps coming up is disability access. Um, I think, is that what you're referring to or, or anything yeah. in particular? That <coughs> well, disability access or any other uh, issues regarding uh, the physicality of a building. Are they going to check uh, acoustic door seals, uh, infection control in terms of uh, wipeable services, floors? all that kind of thing, or are they going to be fairly relaxed? Um, the CQC actually do, are not that concerned about the physicality of the building. It's about, if you pointed out a few, and I'll answer one in, at a time. For example, infection control. You could have carpets on your floor. It's about actually making sure that they're clean. So it's not a question of, and you have to take a practical approach saying, how easy is it for me to keep my carpet clean as opposed to having lino or some other physical element that is just a quick mop, steam, and it's clean. Um, so that's that element. Disability Act, it's once again, it's not, not in the CQC outcomes, but you could have a civil suit by your patient saying there isn't disability access to my building. Having said that, the CQC, all you need to prove to the CQC is that you're taking reasonable precautions and reasonable steps to make that building accessible to your patients and the people that you care for. Sorry, can I just dive, sorry, can I just dive in? Um, I'm Barak Patel. Um, I work with uh, Shabana, I'm a colleague of hers. Actually, that is a very interesting question because that is uh, something that is of a lot of concern to practices. I think the way to look at this is not to look at the individual things, but look at why a CQC inspection happens, why they come into your building. What they're looking for is one simple thing. Are your patients safe? 
and are you treating them safely? So when you look at your practice, it really doesn't matter whether you're, li whether you're working from a really old building or a modern building or what is there or what's missing. The, the key question is, are your patients sa is your patient safety guaranteed? And if the answer is yes, which I think in most practices it is, then that is good enough. Um, the, the question you've asked is very valid because we hear in the press about PCTs asking you to refurbish your practice and spend huge amounts of money and all that, and that is absolute hokum. You do not have to do that. You just have to ensure that your practice is safe. Thank you very much. You have a question, gentleman here, please, up front, and then a gentleman over here. Uh, Stephen Lawrence, GP in Kent. Um, I understand that the CQC inspectors are potentially likely to look at uh, social media sites uh, in terms of gaining a flavor of the, of the practice. Or, for example, the comments that are left on NHS Choices. Is this true? It's absolutely true. They have been trawling Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, your practice profile, and they have confirmed this in their report, recent report that was published in January saying we will be looking at all these to make an evaluation of where your practice is at. Having said that, we, I agree with you saying it is quite insidious in a way to look at three comments left on our NHS Choices site when I have got a patient list of seven and a half thousand. Um, and there are ways of controlling that and maintaining that, but that's something a practice has to be proactive about and making sure that you encourage all the patients who've had a positive experience to come and go and put, put comments up there as well. I think it's a fair to say as well that, um, I mean, can we just a straw poll? How many practices have a Facebook presence here? Not too many, and uh, we're resisting that uh, at our practice as well. We think it's fraught with difficulties uh, of various different kinds. We have to be very, very careful about allowing people to have unrestricted access to making silly comments anonymously, especially about our services. Thank you very much. We have a gentleman here on uh, the right. Thank you. What happens if the conditions are not met? Suppose something is missing or the conditions are not met. What are the penalties and will they give any time to? Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, yes, they do give you time. They, it depends on what condition you have not met. Um, it's anything from, if it's something minor or that what they consider minor, they give you anything from seven days to 28 days to comply. Um, penalties. After that, if you haven't complied, obviously you can give them an action plan saying, I am preparing to do X, Y, Z. If you ignore it, they actually even have the recourse of taking you down the criminal um, prosecution route as well, and they have got that authority as well. Um, but let's be absolutely fair. I don't think the CQC are going to go down that route. What they do can do is restrict your license to trade, so they can either restrict what services you provide, depending on whatever that condition was, or they can suspend it saying, until that condition is met, you are not allowed to open your doors. So it's not like they'll take the license away, they'll just suspend it for whatever period, if the condition. And once again, it depends on what it is. I can't just give you a blanket answer for that. Okay. C can I add to that? Um, legislation and regulation, whenever you read any regulation or legislation, there is a get out clause in absolutely everything. And that is that you must have taken reasonable precautions. If you take reasonable precautions, then you cannot be prosecuted, you, you, you cannot be penalized. So when we look at practice, my, our view is when we go to clients, our view is that 95% of the GP practices are not ever going to be prosecuted because they have taken, taken a reasonable precaution. Let's face it, most GP practices have been complying with standards for better health and God knows what for the last 20, 25 years. There is unlikely to be something so serious that somebody is going to prosecute you. The only time that sort of thing happens if, if the uh, GP is deliberately belligerent, and that, that's a very, very small minority. Thank you. Um, a little tip from me. I sat all our staff down at the practice and made them watch the Forty Towers episode called The Hotel Inspectors. Don't know how many people here remember that one. Two dead pigeons in water tank take out. So there we go. We have a lady down here. And this will be the last question when we, and we'll wrap up. Hi, I'm a practice manager from East Sussex, and we have one main surgery in two branches. Um, when you have a visit, do they opt to choose to visit the main practice, or can they pick any of your branch surgeries? Actually, that's quite an interesting one, because what they've said and what they've um, indicated is they'll come to the main practice, and 
they have the option of actually jumping in a car with you or without you and going and visiting the branch surgeries as well. Okay, I think that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our two guests here uh, who've guided us through this uh, some, something of a minefield very, very nicely. I wish you all the best with your CQC inspection, if, well, not if, when it happens. Uh, and in the meantime, have a very pleasant evening. Fill in the response forms. If you're going home, have a safe journey home. If you're going out, please make sure you're not falling asleep in the plenaries tomorrow morning. Uh, have a wonderful evening. And thank you very much for your attention and your attendance here this today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you again. And there's some